Hello, welcome back to Scripture Central. I'm Lynn Hilton Wilson, and this is John W. Welch with our Come Follow Me in 2 Nephi, chapter 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And it's a two-day sermon by Jacob. Nephi has asked Jacob to record this huge section of space in his scripture. And as part of that, Nephi also asks Jacob to quote specifically some verses on Isaiah. So let's start with chapter six. Okay, Lynn, would you say that this is easy reading or hard reading? You know, all of second Nephi is for a mature spirit who is seeking to understand a deeper connection with our Savior as our Redeemer. I think chapter 9 is probably some of the best messages we have on the atonement of Jesus Christ in all Scripture. So this is some of my favorite reading, but it requires um, a little more than someone who's looking for a storyline and speed reading. And I think this material is about as dense as it gets in terms of profound doctrine, references to aspects of the plan of salvation, the covenants, the temple. And it's interesting to me that this may be Jacob's first really major public sermon as the high priest in the new temple there in the uh, city of Nephi. You know, this is interesting that you said the high priest priest, because we just finished the temple last week in chapter five, that's built. And he said, 30 years have passed since we left Jerusalem. And now 40 years have passed. And Jacob was born sometime in that first eight years of leaving Jerusalem. So he would have been over 30. And 30 is the age where a priest can begin serving in the temple. He's worked in the temple, but probably not as the high priest. I'm sure they're formalizing and adopting things. Who has the right to build a temple? We talked about this a little bit last week. But starting in chapter 6, we learn that they had the right to build the temple, even though they weren't from Aaron, even though they're not from the Levitical tribe, because of the holy order. Behold, my beloved brethren, which he repeats over and over. I love this as the beloved brethren sermon. I, Jacob, having been called of God and ordained after the manner of his holy order— and having been consecrated. Okay, I think he is set apart, he's sustained, and the holy order is what? It would be the Melchizedek order of the high priesthood. Yeah, and and they don't have to name it. It's not Melchizedek. You know, we refer to it that way, but it's God's order. Well, it's higher than the Aaronic order. And so this holy order of priesthood will be something that Alma will talk a lot about in Alma chapter 13. But this little phrase, it's not mentioned very often, as you point out. Holy order, we can kind of skip right over that. But it's important for Jacob now to be a full-fledged high priest and running the temple according to all of its procedural and administrative and spiritual requirements. And I think that that's the way we run a temple. You can't just build a temple and declare yourself, all right, now I'm the, the high priest. It's all done according to the order of God. Well, and this order um, is interesting because in the Book of Mormon, when we talk about the priesthood, uh, not very often, but we talk about the holy order or ordination or consecrated or even the gifts of the priesthood, such as the oath and the covenant, the, the, the power of the priesthood that come in saturates the Book of Mormon. And this is our first reference to the holy order. But if we look at this broader definition for priesthood, looking for callings and offices and the power of God, the Book of Mormon is filled hundreds and hundreds of references. I've even done the research, divide them up by chapter. And these segments that refer to the priesthood start in 1 Nephi and go clear through Moroni. And it is fascinating to see how many times they are calling on the power of God in the Book of Mormon. I think this is really important what you're saying because we kind of take priesthood as a given. But for Nephi to establish now the holy order of the priesthood that will be followed throughout the Book of Mormon sets a fundamental pattern which will, of course, be replicated and implemented by Joseph Smith in sections of the Doctrine and Covenants, like section 20, and section 84, section 107, and we've got them, and others. 
but we we don't take it upon ourselves to officiate in the, in these ordinances as hebrews says no man take it upon himself save he is called of god by prophecy and by the laying on of hands but my research on the priesthood in the book of mormon is beyond those who are ordained in that call to include as joseph smith did the gifts of the Spirit and the blessings of the Spirit, because you cannot receive the gift of the Holy Ghost until you have these other blessings. And I see the power of godliness under the umbrella of priesthood just from beginning to end in the Book of Mormon. But before we get to chapter 9, we need to look at chapters 7 and 8 for a minute where Jacob quotes Isaiah 49, 22 through Isaiah 52, 2. I'm fascinated that so many of these verses from Isaiah that he quotes are actually um, referring to our Messiah as the Redeemer, as the Anointed One. Jacob would have been especially attracted to, and maybe Nephi asked him to read these because you have the only time in the Book of Mormon that Jesus is called the Mighty One of Jacob. And I think Jacob must have loved that. Yeah. That the Redeemer, Jesus Christ, is the Mighty One of Jacob. And how reassuring that would be to have a personal connection there. Also, I think we have in these chapters, in chapter 6, verse 17, the promise that God would protect his people. The mighty God shall deliver his covenant people. And I think how fragile this little society, this little group of followers of Nephi must have felt. And to know that they're right off the bat, that they have the promise that God will protect them. In 2 Nephi chapter 6, Jacob describes that he's had a vision and he points out different things in this vision. And one of them is that of Jesus' death. And verse 8 and 9 and 10 all talk about the crucifixion and he's going to be smitten and then the people are scattered after that. And then he goes on in chapter 7 to quote the Isaiah chapters that describe the same thing. And as we look at 7 verse 6, you'll recognize this, I think, Jack from Handel's Messiah. I gave my back to the smiter and to my cheeks to them that plucketh out the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting, but the Lord God will help me. Therefore, I will not be confounded. You know, he, he had this vision himself that he describes in chapter six, and now he giving a witness of it from Isaiah, the same thing, a second witness again being described. I can just see Jacob striving to add another voice to his on this message. We have got to prepare for this day. But remember, too, that Nephi has suggested that Nephi, that Jacob should read these chapters. Yes, he did. That's why he's saying them in his talk. I wonder if Jacob hadn't already been discussing with Nephi some of these things. Nephi could have said, Jacob, what you have seen goes beyond what I mentioned back in my vision in First, First Nephi. Nephi chapter 11. But it was clear that, to me, that something would happen to the Savior, and now you're seeing this, and it was spelled out in Isaiah. Maybe Nephi and Jacob had been doing some scripture study together and ran across this and now understand it better. And that will then lead to even further information that Jacob will get during the night between these two days of his speech. Yeah, he is a visionary man, and he has visions that are reported in chapter 6 and visions that are reported in chapter 9 and 10. I, I am really touched by the idea, though, that these visions probably came from the Scripture study. And those two verses in Isaiah 50 are so remote and obscure that the people in the time of the New Testament didn't even realize that they were the Messiah. And yet Jacob did. And the Lord expanded it for him. I hope the Lord expands our scripture study. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. One other thing that I think is present in these passages, I've enjoyed looking at all of the different names that are used for Jesus Christ throughout the New Testament. There are a lot of them, but there are some that are unique to Jacob. 
And he, as a priest, you might understand why he uses some of these. A unique name that Jacob uses is Jesus is the mighty God. He likes the fact that, that Jesus is God, for one thing, but he's mighty. He then talks about three ways in which God uses this might. He calls him at one point the maker and also the great creator. Those are the ones that are unique to Jacob. And when you think of what the temple is based on, it's a model of the creation and how we go through the steps of creation so and Jacob the fall. And, and so if Jacob is giving this sermon at the temple and as a newly called priest. And he will then call the Lord by this name, giving primacy to his role as the creator, the one who comes and creates this earth. God is creating in a way, but through the work of Jesus Christ. And I'm really touched by, again, the emphasis on Jesus as our Redeemer. You know, we think of our Savior, as we mentioned, these names of the Lord, I, you know, the 101 or however many there are in the Book of Mormon, he chooses those of a redemptive nature. And it's, it, to me, this is the whole point of the sacrament. It's not, yes, he's a good shepherd. Yes, he's the kind way. Yes, he is the living water. But his redemptive nature is the message of the sacrament. It's the message of the atonement. And he's leading up to the greatest part of the sermon, which is will be the atonement. But even in chapter 8, when he's quoting Isaiah, he's quoting the redemptive verses. Look at verse 11, chapter 8. Therefore, the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come with singing to Zion and everlasting joy. You know, Jack, when I have fallen on my knees in repentance and have felt forgiveness from the Lord, have felt redeemed, that's how I feel. I feel this way. And you felt joy. And what else does he say? And holiness. And, and holiness. Again, Jacob is so interested in the holy, becoming holy, becoming pure, to feel the joy. Is, is, of course, a wonderful, exhilarating thing, but to feel the holiness, to feel that you're clean and that you're worthy. And that's the whole idea of the temple. It is the altar, the, the great and last sacrifice will be taken our sins, and we then can be cleansed. And when, when we experience this, carry on with verse 11, that joy and holiness shall be upon their heads, and they shall obtain gladness and joy, sorrow and mourning shall flee away. And he's still quoting Isaiah, Isaiah here. Isaiah, I know, but how relevant that is. It's not just randomly selected. Again, Nephi has said, Jacob, why don't you read this? This will be a perfect choice for your, <laughs> for your <speech."> sermon. <laughs> I love verse 12. I am he, meaning God, uh, yeah. Jehovah here. I am he that comforteth you. Behold. Who art thou? That thou shouldest be afraid of man, and who shall die, and the son of man, who shall be like unto grass. I don't think he's referring to Jesus there as the son of man. That's just the son of humanity. Yeah. So he's saying, let's keep our focus on God and not be so worried about peer pressure, about fashion, about things of the world. Right now, it's not even politically correct to talk about Christianity. And yet we've been told that as a Christian, we need to speak of Christ. Chapter 9, verse 1 begins with the overview. Now behold, my beloved brethren, I have read these things. Why has he read these Isaiah passages? He tells us in verse 1, that ye might know concerning the covenants of the Lord that he has covenanted with all the house of Israel. And he goes not just through the time of the Savior's life and death, but in verse 2 he says, and that they shall be restored to the true church and fold of God, that they shall be gathered home to the lands. Because I think in their memory, Israel has just been destroyed by the Assyrians a hundred years before and by the Babylonians. Babylonians coming up soon. Right now. Well, it's Lehi. already happened. It they happened know that, before. But... And so he's saying, no, they're going to be gathered to the lands of their inheritance, to the lands of their promise. In verse 6, as the death has passed upon all men to fulfill the merciful plan of our great creator, you already mentioned that wonderful name of the Lord there, there must needs to be a power of resurrection. So this is our first reference to that 
ideology in the Book of Mormon, the resurrection must needs come upon man. This is not something that's in the Old Testament that we have, but it may have been in the brass plates. But he certainly learned it from an angel or someplace because he talks about the resurrection quite a bit. He says it must needs come unto man by reason of the fall. And the fall came by reason of transgression because man became fallen. They were cut off from the presence of the Lord. This is why we need in verse seven, an infinite atonement. And it has to be an infinite atonement, which is can avoid this corruption, this problem that happens as we become entangled with sin and our bodies are going to grow old and our spirit and our body are connected. And so our sins even affect our bodies sometimes. And this is the first time I think that the phrase infinite atonement is used in the Book of Mormon. Now, it will be used, especially by Alma later on. But it's not a limited atonement, which the Calvinists thought in the 19th century. This is an atonement for everyone. And it's not the kind of atonement that was being performed in the Temple of Solomon, the ancient Israelite temple. Which had to be repeated over and over. Every year you had to come back and do the Day of Atonement again. This would be an eternal atonement that will be done once and for all. And why does it have to be eternal? Well, it has to be eternal, verse 7 says. Save it should be an infinite atonement, this corruption could not put on incorruption. What Jacob now is introducing is the idea that this atonement will be an infinite atonement, and it can be infinite in an infinite number of ways. And what it will prevent, among other things, during this life or whenever, is the natural inclination for all things to degenerate physical matter, that there is a principle that all things that are material tend to become disorderly, to tend toward chaos. If it weren't for some power holding physical matter together, keeping it from entropy, we would be degenerating all the time. But the atonement holds us together. Now, not just physically, but also spiritually. And and so the power of the atonement is infinite in its reach and time. It's not just something that's going to apply later when we're resurrected. It's operating right now. And in fact, Jacob, as he's talking about this, we're not going to lay down and rot and crumble to Mother Earth. He's so excited Oh, the wisdom of God, his mercy, his grace. I mean, I could just see Jacob pleading with them to understand how wonderful this gift is. Do we comprehend it? For behold, the flesh should rise no more. Our spirits. Anyway, he talks then about the devil and our spiritual falling again. And the first parents being beguiled is in verse 9. But in verse 10, oh, how great the goodness of our God. And I know you're going to say something, Jack, because I just read two O's in a row without you commenting yet. <laughs> Verse 8 and 10 are our first two, though, right? In this section, there, there are six O's. O oh, the wisdom, that's verse 8. O oh, how great the goodness, verse 10. O oh, how great the plan, which is our plan of salvation. Salvation that we refer 13. to it as. And then fourth, verse 17. O oh, the greatness and the justice of our God. And then in verse 19, oh, the greatness of the mercy of our God. And finally, verse 20, oh, oh, how how great great. the holiness of our God. So you can see those progressions after praising God for his great goodness and mercy and all that he has done to save all men. And notice in verses 20, 21, he knoweth all things, saves all men suffereth the pains of all men. So we have in this first section the six O's, and now we have the six alls that are kind of clustered there. Oh, all the suffering pains. All He is a master writer. He's careful with his composition. There's no question about that. After all the times where he says, suffered for all men and all the family of Adam, um, he says in verse 26, For the atonement satisfieth the demands of justice upon all those who have not the law given unto them, that they are delivered from the awful monster of death and hell. So even if you didn't know of the Bible or you have never even heard of the man named Jesus, those who did not have the law, 
will still be delivered. I mean, this is the most gracious. The restoration completely opens the door to heaven more than any other faith tradition I've ever studied. And I think as Latter-day Saints, we recognize this, that if you're not accountable, like if for whatever reason, some inability, children who die who are not accountable, they are delivered because his justice comes upon all who have not the law given to them. And there will now be ten woes. Now, in the temple, the Temple of Solomon, there was a plaque that was posted that had the Ten Commandments on it. Under Jewish uh, records, we know that there were several of these kinds of plaques that were posted so that men and women would know the laws that pertain to them when they come into the temple. But the Ten Commandments were posted right near the door. And they were kind of used as a temple recommend. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Thou shalt not have any other God before me. Thou shalt, and so on. If you are in violation of any of those, you're asked to go home and kind of work things out or, or bring sacrifices to rectify that problem. But it's clear that those are things, 10 no-nos. And so the 10 woes here in Second Nephi chapter 9, um, do they have any, I, I don't know, I've never looked at them in light of the Ten Commandments. Are they like the Ten Commandments? Yeah, well, when we get uh, down to verse 34, uh, woes, numbers uh, 6, 7, 8, and 9 uh, are related to the Ten Commandments. But they start before the Ten Commandments. Uh, woe unto him that has the law given. It has all the commandments, not just the ten, but all of them. In verse 30, but woe unto the rich, who are rich as to things of the world, and because they are rich, they despise the poor. And they are per they persecute the meek, and yeah, their treasure is their God. There that go. is our day and age. <laughs> and the third woe is woe unto the deaf that will not hear. But it's not the deaf. It's the deaf that will not. Will not yeah, hear. I, I love that. that. Voluntarily, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That will not hear, for they shall perish. The, the fourth one, woe unto the blind that will not see, for they shall perish. You, seeing that they see, but see not. Jesus uses the hearing that they hear, but they hear not. Seeing, but they see not. They don't really see or understand no, because no. it's it, we're all blind to things of the spirit is what he's suggesting here. And we need and to change. Five, and number five, woe unto the uncircumcised of heart. Which I also think means keep your thoughts intact as well as your emotions and your Absolutely, desires. Absolutely, as it says, for a knowledge of their iniquities shall smite them at the last day. And now we get to the Ten Commandments ones, the sixth woe. That's right. Woe unto the liar. Thou shalt not bear false witness. And woe unto the murderer. Thou shalt not kill. But notice, woe unto the murderer who deliberately killeth. That's verse 35. Mm -hmm. Right. But what's that deliberately word? Yeah, that's very important. What's that put in there for? Um, because sometimes things happen when it is not deliberate. Right. And it means when you haven't deliberated or pre-planned. Does Jacob know of anyone who oh, killed someone? Oh, I am someone? sure Nephi has preached this oh, very, yeah. very much. Yeah, I'm sure that's why that's added. Yeah, So that's Jacob good. doesn't want to say just, thou shalt not kill. But premeditated. That would put Nephi in, a, we talked about. in an unfavorable light yeah. and an improper light because the law of Moses in Exodus 21 provided an explanation for those who had, for those yeah, that which don't. we talked about before. Yeah. Then and next, well, verse 36, them, commit whoredoms. Is that, I assume, um, adulteries? Well, it's more than adultery, isn't it? Uh, adultery under the law of Moses was a married man and a married woman. Okay, and whoredoms is any infraction of the law of chastity? Well, it's going to a prostitute. And, and if the prostitute was not a married woman... It, it could, yeah, fornication is still a, a, was, a whoredom. Yeah, okay. yeah, it was not good, but it was done, and it wasn't at the same level as adultery. You commit adultery, the man and the woman who have committed adultery, and it takes two, would be stoned. And, and here, that's under Deuteronomy. I think this is interesting. Yeah, go ahead. 
Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 22. Oh, yeah, that is interesting. <laughs> it's a couple problem, yes, right? it's a couple problem. <laughs> you can remember it that way. And then verse not 37, woe unto those that worship idols. So that goes back to the 10th commandment. And 38, and finally, woe unto all those who die in their sins. And that is so tragic um, because we can repent. Right. So the positive would be thou shalt repent. And the woe then naturally comes upon us if we don't. And why? Well, we'll return to God, behold his face, and we'll remain in our sins. But he takes that, all those woes, and he now gives us hope again. He's so good about immediately turning. In verse 39, my beloved, oh, oh, here's another oh, Jack. Oh, my beloved brethren. Now, there will be five, oh, my beloved brethren, right here. <laughs> oh, great. And five is, if you like to think of numbers, you have five fingers. And so the f number five becomes the number of generosity and kindness. Oh, okay. That's lovely. I didn't know that. Okay. And mercy and so on. And so and now we have these five, remember, remember my words and remember that God will be kind, that he is the keeper of the gate. And Jack, I love this imagery of the keeper of the gate. Um, it's not just Peter at the pearly gates here. When Christ says, I am the way, anytime I think of a gate, um, I like to think of the temple, um, the separation between the holy of holies and the holy place. You know, this, this veil that in Solomon's temple was made out of wood, like a gate. But when Christ says, I am the gate and I am the way and I am the path, you know, all of these fit into this. The way that we ba return back to the presence of the Lord, that we can partake of the tree of life without our sins is by going to the keeper of the gate. And who is that? Well, that's at the veil, and that is Jehovah, our Savior, Jesus of Nazareth. He employeth no servant there, because there is none other way to save it, be by the gate. And then in verse 42, he said, whosoever knocketh to him will he open. Now, if I've just described this imagery at the temple, and we're at the veil of the temple, and the veil represents the, the Lord. The Savior, or, or Jehovah the, the at this of point. The Lord. Yeah, we, we cannot enter into his presence unless we are going to knock. I'm so sad about this, but the wise and the learned and the rich and those that are puffed up, this is all verse 42, because of their learning and their wisdom and their riches, yea, they whom he despises. You know, we are not going to get there by the things of the world. We are not going to buy our way in. Instead, he says, oh, my beloved brethren, and I like to imagine him actually taking off his garment when he says, remember my words. Behold, I take off my garment, my outer cloak here, and I shake them before you. And I pray to God. Jack, what is he talking about here? What's this taking off? Was there a, a practice where they used to take off their outer cloak and shake it? Verses like this indicate that there was a practice of taking off your cloak. Now, it's your outer garment. You still have on your tunic, yeah. But the symbolism of shaking the dust, it's like shaking the dust off your feet. But also, when you shake off your garment, you are ridding yourself of responsibility because you have warned the people. And King Benjamin says the same thing, doesn't he? And that's at the temple also. So he ends up that verse 44 by saying, I stand with brightness before him and I'm rid of your blood. So he starts by cleansing, um, by teaching his family. And now at the temple, um, he talks another O in verse 45. 45. So, O oh my beloved brethren, turn away from your sins and you should shake off the chains of him that would bind you fast. Come unto him who is the rock of your salvation. We do not have to remain in the cage from servitude to Satan if we can repent, which we can, we can, we can. And O thou rock of our salvation, it's right out of the Psalms again. Temple Psalms. He knew his scripture. And in verse 46, he goes back to that idea of remembering that you mentioned so many times before. Remember your awful guilt in perfectness and be constrained to exclaim, Holy, holy are thy judgments, O Lord God Almighty. But I know my guilt. 
I, I think this is so important to see these great leaders saying there is a constant need for repentance and turning to our Savior for that cleansing. I really like in this section where there are so many references encouraging us to remember, remember, remember. You can count how many there are. There are quite a few. But when we listen carefully to the sacrament prayers, uh, we first and foremost covenant that we will remember Christ always. And if we remember him, of course, that means more than just a flashing thought. Yeah, or intellectually remembering that he was there. But to remember also means to obey. In Hebrew, the, the word for remember means more than just think about it, also do it. Yeah. If you're really going to remember, you will change your behavior because he has suffered for you and he has called you. And we want to be with him. We want to obey him. And so chapter 9, this beautiful first um, day of his sermon ends by him saying in verse 54, And now, my brethren, I would speak unto you more, but on the morrow I will declare unto you the remainder of my words. Amen. So he's had a long day of sharing their words. And in the ancient world, I know sermons would go from far more than two or three or four hours and um, everyone goes home, and the next day is our last chapter in today's Come Follow Me, chapter 10, Jacob's second sermon. And here Jacob tells us that during the night he received another visitation. And he is now referred to at least two or three visions in this sermon of these two days, which I think is fascinating. Before we prepare, before we give, before we serve, are we seeking that God's revelation? And so he tells us in verse 3 that he had this vision. Wherefore, I say unto you, it must needs be expedient that Christ, for in last night the angel spake unto me that this should be his name. So up until this point, I just did a quick check. There are no other references to that title for our Savior, even though we've had dozens of references to Jehovah and to Messiah. And lots of other names. But here is the first reference in the Book of Mormon to the word Christ. And from here on forward, Christ is mentioned regularly. And I think it's fascinating that his vocabulary is, of course, a mix of Hebrew and a little bit of Egyptian and possibly some, you know, other things tied in over time. But Jacob's still coming out of a family whose mother tongue was speaking Hebrew. And so this means the anointed one. But he then talks about how he's going to be crucified. He had that in his earlier vision. He quoted it from Isaiah, and now he's citing it here. But it all ties the redemptive nature of our Savior. That's why I say this section has more on the atonement than any other section in the Book of Mormon. When you check these passages that Nephi and Jacob have received about the crucifixion, it's coming, like Nephi will say, line upon line, precept upon precept. Uh -huh. so what are you here? Well, first, Nephi learns in back in 1 Nephi chapter 11 that he will be crucified. For sins, yes. but it doesn't say very much about no. how or why. More. And then, in, as we've already said in this lesson earlier, Second Nephi chapter six mm -hmm. verse nine will also say that he will be crucified, but doesn't go into the details. And then here now in chapter ten verse three, he will learn several things. First of all, that no other nation would crucify their That's Lord. Tragic. Absolutely tragic. And it says that they didn't recognize even with the mighty miracles in verse 4. And that's the next thing. It will be because of these miracles that he will work, that they will be suspicious that maybe he is using some improper power. And it's because of those miracles that those who are in charge and are concerned because of priestcrafts and iniquities, they will stiffen their necks against him and he will be crucified. So Jacob has learned a few more things that make sense. And he must have wondered, well, why will this happen? And going on into verse 7, I think this comes out of his vision. What do you think, Jack? Where it says, Thus saith the Lord God, when the day cometh that they shall believe in me, that I am Christ, or Messiah, or the Anointed One, 
Then have I covenanted with their fathers that they shall be restored in the flesh upon the earth and unto the lands of their inheritance. I think this is so important for them because of their situation of being an outcast, but it's so important for us because we are a restored organization who is to do the exact same thing so that we can be prepared to come before our Savior. That's right. Jacob is thinking about even the ones who will reject Jesus. But if the day comes when they believe in him, then they will be restored to their lands of inheritance. Jacob now in verse 10 wants to speak about the land that they are in. The land of thine inheritance. That's right. Now he's speaking to his people. And verse 11, and this land, the land that Jacob is in, shall be a land of liberty unto the Gentiles, and there shall be no kings upon the land who shall raise up unto the Gentiles. And I will fortify this land, strengthen this land. And that's looking way far ahead, because obviously in the history of the Book of Mormon, that is not the case. So this is looking way in advance. And by Gentiles, he's referring to the people who are not there now. And I assume that the land had other people there as well. But we'll talk about that more when we get some references to it. And in that fortification of the nations and the lands, I want to read from verse 19. I will have all men that dwell thereon, that they shall worship me, saith God. Now, unfortunately, we live in a time where not everyone living in the Western hemispheres are worshiping God. And I think that's one reason why we have to have another purging. That's why we're trying to gather Israel. And I think what this is saying when he says, I will have all men that dwell, the word will there means want. I will it. It is my wish. I will that all. Uh, I think that this open door where God will consecrate the land forever for Jacob's seed, so it will be a land for their inheritance. And it's a choice land because not only them, but all who will worship the Lord will be blessed in this land as well. Moving ahead to verse 23, therefore cheer up your hearts. So we should be happy, is that right? Well, this is so fascinating to me because usually, I've looked at every single time this is used in scripture, Cheer up or, or be of good cheer is used in devastating, horrific times. You're in prison. You're drowning. You're, the Lord has just announced his death. You know, he's saying we can always find hope and trust in our Savior. And remember, in addition to being cheerful, yeah. be positive about things. And then remember that ye are free to act for yourselves. This is why you can cheer up. It's because you have mental and emotional capabilities to, to think, to control your mind. And then the next few words, where does Jacob get these words from? To choose the way of everlasting death or the way of eternal life. Who has said that before? Lehi. Lehi. He's remembering back to the blessing. Whose blessing? His. His own, exactly. This is where Lehi blessed, and we read that talked about that a few uh, weeks ago yeah jacob remembered that blessing well and they probably could have read it if they, if nephi was able to write it down i presume it was also recorded by others too oh, and i'm sure jacob memorized that they were so phenomenal at memorization and this would have been his personal blessing it must have been a, a guidepost you know it must have been a you know a, a light to his path throughout his life and he ends this beautiful sermon back on the topic of the resurrection verse 25 Wherefore, may God raise you up from dead by the power of the resurrection and also from everlasting death and the power of the atonement. He, this is the best chapter in the whole Book of Mormon on the atonement. It's just set. And no one else understands it like Jacob explains it to us. But this then became the foundation of our understanding of the restoration because of this great sermon by our dear new priest, Jacob. It is so complete and so articulate with all these nuances and details and it it speaks to everyone and there's something that everyone can find inspiration here wherever you are on the path wherever you are find a word or a phrase you can ponder these things and jacob will be a light to you 
And he will then help you to reconcile yourselves to the will of God and not to the will of the devil. Again, there is so much hope in coming to our Savior. That's the choice. And his arms are outstretched for us all. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.